Why do we photograph? Why do we create images? Why do we create in general? There can be several reasons. For photographers in particular, the purpose of creating an image can be memory. To catch a moment, to remember a moment, a place, a person. More broadly, and encompassing all kinds of visual creators such as painters, graphic designers and so on, the goal can also be illustrative. Things such as visual communication, marketing, public relations, commercial purposes. There is also something else which is more noble, which is a way of expressing oneself. And this is the most beautiful part of photography, images, or of any form of art. And this is what my father wanted to teach, and what I would like to continue teaching. This is what phenomenology of the image can teach. What is it that we want to express? One could say our emotions. But there is a more beautiful and more extensive word than emotions, which is our living experiences. We want to convey our living experiences. In French, vécu. In German, erlebnis. Our living experiences. This phrase is at the same time so broad and explicit that it encompasses any words that come to our mind regarding the subject of expression. And this is what we can do with any type of creativity to express our living experiences. Now, to be able to express that, it's not so easy because photography, or more broadly, images, are not a language, not strictly a language, but they have a structure. It is a system, a visual system. And then we have to learn something about the system in order to be able to express ourselves. To communicate our living experiences through images, we have to learn a way of visual expression, which is also felt by other people. And not only when creating, but also when perceiving images. We also have to learn the different possible ways to perceive potential subjects and images, and also to become aware of the consequences of our ways of looking at images. This is a process which is currently supported by neurological research. What are the basis of the structure of a visual system? There are two. The reactions of the human nervous system to visual stimulation, that's one and a consciousness of what has endured the test of time in the evolution of image-making from its known beginnings. For example, cave paintings estimated around 50,000 years ago. Throughout the ages, since the appearance of Homo sapiens or even Homo neanderthalensis, there are stable elements in the images created by different cultures which are independent or minimally dependent of symbolic meaning or other intellectual interpretations. If we look at those very ancient images today, we can appreciate them as much as we cherish works created in closer times, even though they were created in other cultures and within a different historical context. It is these phenomena of stability which are the base of the structure of a visual system. 
having a basically unchanged nervous system and a common spirit with our creative ancestors, the elite of painters, sculptors and architects whose work is timeless. Some people even consider this common spirit to be our genetic heritage, which is transmitted genetically by our ancestor from one person to the next throughout entire generations. A visual system in its pure form, meaning without accompanying text, words, titles, explanations, or sounds. We call it a visual system, by lack of a better word, and to avoid calling it a language, because it is not strictly a language. A visual system being in between a language and music, and shares properties from both. Take a series of sounds. When is a series of sounds a melody? When there is a relation between the sounds. Otherwise you can play anything and it doesn't make any sense. There has to be a relation between the sounds. Music is created by a series of sounds and the relation between them. In the same way, an image is formed by its elements and the relations between them. An image is not simply a few fragments that we look at, but it is a whole. So we have to look at the elements of the image and at their relations. Because if we do not perceive the relations, we do not perceive the image. What are the elements of an image? Elements of an image can have different characteristics different sizes, different shapes, different texture, different types of reflection of the light. There can be salient areas, or if we focus our sight more, our sight itself being limited because of how our retina is made. We have something called the macula, which is five by five millimeter, and it is the only area where we can see sharply. Which means that when we are looking at an image, we have to do something called a visual trace. And the duration and the direction of our visual trace can greatly influence our emotions and the way we experience an image. This is why relations between the elements of an image are so essential. Relations can be physical and have an impact especially on the form and composition of an image. A few principles for a good composition are, for example, to avoid chaos, to put everything in order, to create rhythms and repetitions of shapes. Every element matters. There can be dissonant elements, like in music. In exploring composition, we have to discover general principles, not rules, that can direct the consciousness of the creator to relevant aspects of the formation of an image. But relations can also be intellectual, such as symbols, metaphors. Relations can be emotional, positive emotions, negative emotions. raw, basic emotions, primal emotions, more subtle emotions, or emotions with varying degrees of subtleties and various shades of the same emotions, or mixed emotions, 
emotions intertwined with each other, also with various shades of intensity and subtlety. And finally, relations can be transcendental. And all these relations can have a very strong impact on the content of an image. The most important content, if not the only one, that any creative person can express is truth. It is not a scientific, documentary, intellectual or objective truth. It is an inner truth, an authentic living experience, which may reach a spiritual dimension. Only such a truth, if it is well expressed, can deeply touch an appropriately educated and prepared audience. By content, we are mainly interested in truth and authenticity, which can be both emotional, such as authentic emotions and deep living experiences, but it can also be transcendental and manifest through vibrations and energy. Transcendental relations, which are connected to the development of our own spirituality, in which we all have the potential to develop. It lies dormant within each one of us, usually, and needs to be awakened. Awakening the spiritual potential is one of the ways to develop our sensitivity towards transcendence and transcendental relations, which we can then perceive in works of art. Transcendental relations are also connected to the secret of great masters of art and how they put themselves into a specific state, like a state of trance, which gives them a chance to create a masterpiece. The characteristics of such masterpieces is that they are universal and timeless. And as creators or even perceivers of such works of art, we then become witnesses of the timeless. Another important thing is that we cannot express what we have not experienced ourselves. If we want to create an image that has content, its elements and the relations between them must become a stimuli to a living experience, emotional or transcendental. And emotional and transcendental relations can only be perceived if a creator's visual sensitivity is directly connected to his or her emotional or spiritual realm. Sensitivity cannot be taught, it can only be acquired. In order to perceive such a content, a perceiver must undergo an internal preparation. The instrument of the creator is the creator himself, herself, and his sensitivity, her sensitivity which must be nurtured. And also the development of visual sensitivity goes together with the enhancement of intuition. What is phenomenology of the image? What are the origins of my father's phenomenology of the image? It was inspired by Sergio Celibidake's phenomenology of music, which in turn was created based on Edmund Husserl's phenomenology as a philosophical school, and it was concerned with the appreciation and the study of the actions of phenomena on human consciousness. There is a major difference between phenomenological and scientific research. Phenomenological research is different from scientific research in that it is not concerned with the discovery of physical laws, but instead it is concerned with the discovery of ageless, objective principles which in turn depend on one's sensitivity, and in our case, sensitivity to relations, both for the creator 
and the perceiver of a work of art. Also in this case, a subjective opinion doesn't mean much, because everything can be subjective, and everything can be one's personal opinion, and then it doesn't mean anything anymore. In the case of a phenomenological approach, we use terms such as reference system, intersubjectivity. We say that the reference systems of a creator and, his, and the perceiver intersect, that there is intersubjectivity between them, if they have something in common, and if their sensitivities are aligned. We say that there is something in common between them, and at that moment, there is a triangle forming between creator, work of art, and perceiver. I should find myself in you, and you should find yourself in me. A concept which refers both to the author and the performer, and to the recipient. We also use terms such as the essence, the essence of a work of art, the essence of a subject, the essence of an image. Essence is an undefined, discernible energy generated by material or immaterial objects which can be both emotional and transcendental. In the case of a work of art, they can be both emotional and transcendental. In our case, we could focus on people, elements of nature, scenes from everyday life. The process which allows us to reach the essence of a given subject, or creation, is, is known as reduction. It is a manner of perception without knowledge, without judgments, without comparisons, without preconceptions. It enables the reception of the vibrations emanating from a given subject or creation. All these concepts, principles and ideas are parts of my father's phenomenology of the image. My hope is that as we explore them together, they eventually will help both visual creators and perceivers of works of art to become more conscious of the nature of an image, to learn how to create or perceive an image, or even a subject, with a pure regard, a pure regard without intellectual pollution, to be aware of its expressive potential, for spectators of images to deepen their living experiences, to develop our visual sensitivity, emotionally and transcendentally, similarly to great masters, and hopefully, to learn to express ourselves through images. The depth of our work, and how deeply it can reach an audience, will depend on two factors. What we experience ourselves as creators, and our ability or talent to express it. What we express can range from basic emotions to a transcendental experience where in a similar way to great masters we forget ourselves during our creative activity and we open up to receive and release an undefined energy which we transmit to our audience, a prepared audience through our work. When this happens, then we can say that there is a triangle forming between us our work, and the recipients of our work. When this happens, then we can say that we have created a true, universal, timeless masterpiece. A true work of art.